Did you guys have a good weekend? No. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> too short. Too what? Too short. Too, well, yeah, too short. I was finally sleeping well this morning. Darn alarm, but oh well. <laughs> it was one of those, you know, you go, oh yeah, I think I got 20 minutes. Beep, 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 dang it. <laughs> okay, well, today we get to review. And I'm going to open up first to see if anything is bothering you. What would you like to know? Because you guys all studied hard and reviewed and go, hey, I'm, I'm a little confused on this. Give me some more input. So let's just jump to what you guys are bothered with at the moment. Yes? That was the first question of the last homework, correct? Yes. Good. That was in my notes to uh, go over. 81% uh, of you got it right. So that's not ridiculous. The good news for you is uh, that was, I think, the worst question. It means you, most of you did well on all the others. So yeah, the question is, a. Uh, they could have changed the number by the time I did this. We'll just use this one that I'm making up here. We have a 415 kilogram bear. I'm just going to stop right there. What does, that, what does that mean? What's that tell you? Good. Okay, so we, we got a feel for how big he is, mass. Oh, that's something with inertia, Newton's first law. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, he's grasping a vertical tree. And he, starts, he slides down at a constant velocity. I can't draw, so. <laughs> OK. It's a skinny bear. Uh, the, the lecture right before this is Physics of the Human Body. And they had a guest lecturer. And he was uh, actually over 400 pounds. And he had the gastric bypass surgery. And now he's, he's real skinny. So see, it, it works. OK. A uh, 400 kilogram bear grasping a vertical tree slides down at constant velocity. Pause. What else do we learn? No acceleration. How do you know that? It's a constant velocity. Right. Velocity is not changing, thus, remember what acceleration is? It's a change in velocity. It takes a certain amount of time. So that's got to be zero. What is the friction force that acts on the bear? So he's, he's falling down. Which way does friction act? Up. So this is we call his weight. This friction. And now we just have to, oh, how the heck do we figure this out? What else do we know? Okay. So I, we just, I'm just trying to reason out loud how I would think through this, lest you don't have the process. What else does this imply? Let's see. OK, I, I remember Adam said something like, OK, if these forces were balanced, what would be true? The acceleration would be 0. That's true. So they, 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 they're probably balanced. OK, if, if they're balanced, is the bear moving? Could be. As long as it was already moving when the forces became balanced. He says if as long as he was already moving when they became balanced. So I think you're getting it. it he could not be moving. But it doesn't mean he doesn't have to not be moving. <laughs> Double negative. So yeah, it just means his net force, put it over here. The book uses that. The sum of all the forces are zero. I've been liking to just say the net force is zero. So he's moving at a constant velocity. So that's the case. So I, I'm going to adjust this because it's a vector, so it looks more to scale here, roughly. Yeah, they're more of the same magnitude. Wait, if they're the same magnitude, what's the frictional force? It's whatever his weight is. And I think this, is, this was a more of a multiple step question instead of just you just spit out one thing. 
do you, are you with me to this point? You realize the frictional force has to balance his weight? So if we could just figure out his weight, I got the answer. So how do we find weight? Yeah, that's its mass times the acceleration due to gravity alone. And so that would be 415 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. Newtons, or kilogram times a meter divided by second squared, which is the same thing as a newton. So that's the frictional force on the bear because he's sliding down at constant velocity. So if I make, put a twist on that, which I very well could, let's say he's accelerating down, but less than g. He's accelerating down the tree, picking up speed, but at less than 9.8 meters per second squared, or 10. So how does frictional force compare in that case? We've got to vote for less than that. Any other? You guys got quiet. I'm going to take that as you agree. You're right. Well, what we can tell is the frictional force would be less than 4,150 newtons. Because if it was a little more, 4,150, then we wouldn't be accelerating. And vice versa. If the acceleration was more, then he'd be going up the tree. But, <laughs> yeah. I am totally fine using 10. I just, yeah, just, as long as you were, technically it's 9.8, but uh, you can make your math easier. It's fine with me. <laughs> what if the bear had a tighter grip on the tree? How, how would that affect Let's, that, that question? Let's say, now the bear got, gets scared and holds on tighter. He's still falling down at constant velocity. What's the frictional force now? What do you think, Ennis? Oh, take a guess. Gut. Oh, well, we're going to be here a while. Oh, come on. <laughs> if as long as it's still a constant velocity then the frictional force must still be the same. What we want to think, though, is, uh, yeah, rip your hands up. If you grab tighter, if nothing else changes, yeah, that'll create more friction. So if, let's say he's going along now at constant velocity, but all of a sudden he grips tighter. That will change his frictional force and cause him to slow down to a stop. He'll decelerate because he just increased this. And if he does that, then at some point, this is bigger than that. He'll decelerate until he comes to a stop. Does that make sense? So if he's just holding on tight enough just to slow his, his speed, what it's causing that? In, re in reality, he can't. But on average, he could. If this is more than his weight, then he'll decelerate. So what, in reality, what people do is you know, they grab a little tighter, then they might let go. It's kind of stick and slip. And so on average, you can keep these the same so that he's going at a... His velocity is not changing, but that velocity is smaller. Yes. But in order to, uh, so, well, does that part make sense before I go off on another tangent? <laughs> yeah, I'll keep trying. See, if I don't get it first time, I realize. Let's, let's say it this way then. I mean, I'll try it a different way. You said something on the front row. Was it James? I forgot your name. You're James? You said something at the beginning. As long as whatever velocity he was going at the initially, he would stay going that velocity, right? Is that you? Yeah. If the are yeah, if the forces are balanced. We'll go with that clue. You can balance the forces, 
and you'll stay going whatever velocity you were currently going before that, right before that. So if you're falling down at 10 meters per second and you balance these but with your grip, you'll stay at 10 meters per second and not change. But if you grip tighter to slow yourself down and then maintain a tighter grip, you'll slow down and say you get to 5 meters per second. Once you get there though, you don't have to grip as tight. You only have to grip as much as your weight, provide enough friction as your weight, and now you'll maintain that five meters per second. So you grip tighter to decelerate, when this, because that means that's bigger. Once you get to a speed you're comfortable with, you can relax a little and not have to grip as tight to maintain that speed. And why do we maintain that speed? Which law? It's the first law. It's because of inertia. We're not accelerating anymore once they're balanced, and so whatever motion we were currently in will maintain that motion. It won't change unless a force comes to, ch to act on us. Does that help? Oh, good. Yeah. Is the formula for net friction the same as net weight? Yeah. That sums up Newton's second law. Read me. This one is a specific case. If we want to know what the uh, force on the earth pulling us down is alone by itself, it's causing our mass to try to accelerate at gravity, acceleration due to gravity, 10 meters per second squared. And so you plug that in and that gets you just your weight alone. So yeah, you can just do F equals MA for a specific case. Also, we could come up here and do MA due to friction. And we can figure out just what the force due to friction was. If you want to figure out the motion of an object, though, you need to account for all the forces. We, did, you, did you guys see you can actually figure out now what the acceleration due to friction is? We got to the point where we understood that's the frictional force. And it's the same mass, same bear. So we could solve for this A and see what it is. And let's see how clever the clever folks in the class are. What is A? It's the same as G, because these are balanced. It's got to work out. So the frictional acceleration is 10 meters per second squared up to balance the 10 meters per second squared down. This is good, because I wanted to go over that one anyway. Reviewed lots. Do you think you could do it again? I I'm, I'm, uh, got most of the test written. Actually, I, I, ha I have it written. There's just two. Here you go. See? I just have too many questions. I'm in the process of uh, getting rid of some because you guys don't want to answer 79 questions. <laughs> oh, it's just, that was my first show. I'm like, no, no, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, and I get done and I go, let's see how many I have. Don't worry, I'm not planning on. <laughs> I'm, I won't have near 79, don't worry. And I'm taking them, like I've told you, from homework, from uh, the book, from WebAssign. Uh, uh, the, the author has a whole other bank of test questions that aren't in here, you know, but he wrote them, so they're the same style. They're going to all be multiple choice. The test will be right here Wednesday, and that's all we'll do. If you finish the test in 10 minutes, you can leave. <laughs> But I, uh, I'm trying to write it so that you don't, somebody will always be here till the end, but I, I don't think you'll feel like, oh, dang, I didn't have time to address all these questions. I don't like those kind of tests. Well, if at least you came to class and are at least trying. I, you, if you haven't come to one of them, you might be here the whole, the whole time. Other questions? Okay. What about our weight of us on the Earth and the Moon? Well, let's, let's take this guy, since we already calculated it. What's his weight on Earth? That's his mass. What's his weight on Earth? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, what we just did. That is his weight, 4,150 newtons. Multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. So on the moon, how does the weight compare? Yeah, it's less. It's a, it's a sixth. So if I want to know what my, this bear's weight is on the moon, We don't, we, if you knew that, fine, you just plug it in. We don't. We just know it's a sixth of this. Oh, let's see. A sixth of, whoop. So 41, 50 divided by 6, 5, 15, 2, there we go. 525 newtons. Oh, it's 30. Thank you very much. See, that's why you guys are here. Did you already calculate it then? 600 and... 91? <laughs> 691.6? Okay. <laughs> You'll have calculators on your exam if you don't want to do it longhand. I want that to be the stress. So that's the weight on the moon. It's a sixth of what the weight is on Earth. And now you could go and figure out what this is if you wanted to. Or, the interesting part is, that's what A is on Earth. A sixth of that should be the acceleration on the moon. Because if you plug a sixth of that in here and calculate it this way, you'll get the same answer. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Next. I got more too if you run out. Don't worry. <laughs> I have a question about number five on the homework. It said when you jump vertically off the ground, what is your acceleration? Number five on the homework. You jump vertically off the ground. What's your acceleration at the highest point? All right, that's like me throwing the chalk up, and right there at the top, it wants to know its acceleration, right? And you think it is? Be brave. Um, I put zero first, but I knew that was wrong. She put zero first, but knew it was wrong. That's, I I was still accelerating. that's why I asked it. <laughs> no, but I knew that was wrong when I put it in. Because oh. Because still accelerating, but I didn't know what else to put. Oh, you didn't know what else to put. OK. What'd you guess? I guess 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second squared. And why is that correct? Do you know now? That's why you're asking the question. Who knows? Who feels confident? Gravity. Okay, what's the acceleration on the way up? 10 meters per second squared. What's the acceleration on the way down? What's the acceleration at the top? Yeah, because it's the attraction of Earth pulling on it. And it's pulling it down whether this thing's going up, stops for a moment, or comes back down. It's always trying to accelerate it this way, the Earth. That's what slows it down and why it stops at the top. It's starting to move up. It's got a certain velocity whoosh, right there. And then its velocity decreases, decreases, decreases. Why? Because it's being accelerated down. It's changing its velocity. You with me? It doesn't matter how long you're in the air. I could jump whoo, five miles up, whee, come back down. I, it would take a lot bigger initial velocity to get me up in the first place, you know, to shoot me that high. But once I leave the ground, you know, air resistance aside, I'm, I'm just being accelerated down at 10 meters per second squared. What, on my way up, at the top, and back down. Do you guys believe me? Okay. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yeah, and that's the velocity is not the same thing as acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity. It's how fast you're changing your motion. Velocity is more like your motion when we usually say motion. This is how fast you're going. Acceleration is how fast you're changing, how fast you're going. It's a change of a rate, if you will. And yeah, they're totally different. So you can be moving. Remember the bear? He was sliding down. He's moving. He has a velocity but he's not accelerating. 
with the, when the net force was zero, he's grabbing on, the frictional force counters the gravity. So the net force was zero, he's not accelerating, but he's still moving. So even at the top, for that brief moment, it doesn't move. The velocity is zero for an instant. But he's, he's in the process of changing his velocity. Gravity is still acting on it. There's still a non-zero net force acting on it. Gravity, it's weight. And so that means it's always being accelerated. It's being accelerated, it's being accelerated, it's still being accelerated, it's being accelerated, being accelerated, even though it seems to stop for a moment. I was going to answer her first. She should. Well, I just, the easier way for me to remember that is deceleration is also considered acceleration because you're still changing. That's right. Deceleration is the same as acceleration. It's just in the negative direction, you know, like your car. When you slam on your brakes, you're still moving forward, but slower and slower, which means your acceleration is in which direction? Point, please. Yeah. So instead of accelerating that way, I'm, you're accelerating that way. Thank you. Uh, there was one over here, yes. Um, yeah, on that question, I put negative 10 meters per second. Why was that wrong? Because I thought that would be right. Like so you did enter negative? Yeah. Then send me an email, because you're right. Okay. And the author didn't account for a negative sign. Because, yeah, technically it's a vector, and negative is generally down. So uh, I think you should get the point then for that. No. This whole acceleration. Um, to actually get it thrown up into the air, you're, the only time it's accelerating is when you're moving your arm to throw it up. As soon as you let go, you're not accelerating whatever you're throwing up anymore. The only thing we're acting on is gravity. That's a good distinction, too. And it's a good review. He says, when you throw something up, or shoot it up, whatever, throw, since I'm holding chalk, I'm exerting a force on it right now to, to throw it up. Whoosh. While I'm in contact with it, I can push on it, and I exert a force. That accelerates it, changes its motion from zero velocity up to some velocity. Then I let go of it. And its inertia wants to keep it going until something else acts on it, which gravity starts acting on it. Well, it always was, but I was overcoming it. There was actually a net force here, wasn't there? My propelling force and gravity down. You get the idea. You do have to distinguish that. So remember when you're, you're talking to, I'm j to jump over a, a river, whee! As soon as I leave the ground, what keeps me going forward? Inertia. Inertia is not a force. A force got me up to that speed, but then the force turned off, I left the ground, and inertia just kept me going. Until grav you know, gravity pulled me back down, and I ran into the ground. Uh, hand over here. So while you're in contact with the chalk, its acceleration is not 10 meters per second. So because you're exerting a force on it, so its net force is something different. Good question. Yeah, right now, it's 10 net, net force zero, not accelerating. There's two forces, gravity down, but the support force up. So if I change that support force and increase it, whoosh, now the net force isn't zero, and the up is larger than the down. And so there's a net acceleration up. And that's what increases its velocity up to something when I let go of it. Boy, you, you guys really are. You, you, if you're getting this slowly, you, you're going to know more about the understanding motion and forces than 95% of the population in the world. They just, they just, we do it all the time, but don't realize what's going on. You guys can, can articulate it. Well, okay, you're working on it, right? <laughs> Some of you can, you're showing me. Huh? <coughs> All right. Before I forget, the test will be Wednesday. Oh, yeah, there we are. Uh, Friday, we'll start Chapter 6. And uh, I intend to have the, your homework, uh, next homework posted so you, you, know, you go-getters can start right after the test. <laughs> but uh, Friday, we'll start chapter 6. We're then going to do chapter 7, for those of you who want to read ahead. And chapter 10, but just the section on projectile motion. So 6 and 7.
Let me tell you what this because some people relate to topics better. Six is momentum, seven is energy. And then in 10, chapter 10, we'll cover the projectile motion. That'll get you going. This page. From chapter 1, again, uh, very useful, but I'm not going to test you on what Aristosthenes' experiment was and how he measured distance to moon. What is important is the you know, scientific method, hypothesis, scientific theory, fact, and principle, those definitions, the difference in what they are. If more, and more people in the public knew what a scientific theory really meant, I think there'd be less confusion uh, for that one specifically, because we use theory a lot in the world. People, oh, that's just a theory. That's what they think happens. Uh, you know, your book says, Synthesis of a large body of information that encompasses well-tested and verified hypotheses about aspects of the natural world. So remember those hypotheses were educated guesses, but it kept being tested and tested. A, a, a true scientific hypothesis has to be able to be proven wrong. That's a, a clincher. Not just proven right, but proven wrong. And if it hasn't been proven wrong over time, then we realize, hey, this is, this is how this thing seems to obey. It can become a law or a principle. And a synthesis of various one, laws and principles together form a theory. You know, Newton eventually figured out a theory for gravitation, which involved a, a lot of these things we're, we're learning and more. And that's what we go by today because that's what we observe. This represents it and it works. Granted, we might at some point realize that, oh, we finally did something and really, that's not quite right. So we change it and adjust it and move forward. That, you know, th so theories, facts can actually change. You know, the earth was flat, that was fact. <laughs> Good thing we were able to be flexible. <laughs> that's, that's my, hopefully you take away from chapter one as you review it. Inertia, well, see we already re re reviewed all that. Okay, how, how do you, has anybody tried to explain inertia to somebody since this class started? Not in the class. What, what do you tell somebody? Inertia? What's that? And you say... The resistance of matter to change. I like that. To change what? Yeah, it's motion. And then I, I feel that's even complete. Yeah, if it's at rest, it stays at rest. If it's moving, it'll keep moving. We just normally don't observe a lot of that. So kudos to Newton for realizing that even though friction is in real life, if it wasn't there, this thing would just keep going. We always see things slow down. That leads to the second law, but that's the next section. So hold on, chapter. Let's see what else. That's where we learned about what a force was and net force. I think you guys got that. Equilibrium. That term has come up in the chapter in the homework. If something's in a state of equilibrium, what's that mean? What? The net force is zero. It's balanced, somebody said. It's not accelerating. Doesn't mean, yeah, it can, it can be moving, like the bear sliding down at a constant velocity, but some, they must be balanced, the forces. So let's take that chalk example. At the top, is the chalk in equilibrium? She says no. Who else says no? Who says yes? A few of you. How come the rest of you aren't voting? <laughs> you toss something up in the air. It's a good question. We, I, I think I asked you. Whoosh, right there at the top. For that brief moment when its velocity is zero, is it in equilibrium? Yeah, that sounded more like a consensus. Thank you. It's not in equilibrium because the net forces on it aren't zero. It's still being accelerated down by 10 meters per second squared. So from, yeah, it stopped. So it doesn't mean it's in equilibrium. It's in the process of changing. In the next instant, it's going to be coming down.
Um, linear motion, chapter three. You guys know the difference between speed and velocity, right? <coughs> speed and velocity, difference being? Direction. Speed doesn't have a direction, velocity does, it's a vector. And that's its relationship. Not, not the scary equation, that's just what we observe. The velocity is the distance divided by time. It's, ha it's the rate of change of position. As you change your position in a certain amount of time, that tells you how fast you're going. If you want to know how far you went, I hope you guys can do it. Let's say I went 50 miles an hour for a half an hour. 50 miles an hour at a half an hour. How far did I go? 50 miles an hour for half an hour. 25 miles. That's how far I went. You see that? If I'm going 50 miles per hour for a half an hour, I guess I'll, sorry, do an MI so it looks different than meters, sorry. Yeah, 25 miles. I mean, I bet before this class, if you thought hard enough, you could have figured that out without me giving you this equation. The easier one. Some of you gave me blank looks when I asked you that. But okay, 50 miles an hour. I'm going 50 miles an hour for an hour. How far did I go? And then you just think, how did I figure that out? Oh, yeah, if I'm going 50 miles in one hour, and it took an hour, I would just went 50 miles. Oh, I must have. So if it's only a half an hour, you go half that. Well. You know, put that into an equation and call it a relationship, and it works everywhere for anything. It's great. And this one is what acceleration is. That's velocity is the change in position with time. Acceleration is the change in velocity with time. And we did that. And we did that. Oh, yeah, and this one. We saw that one and discussed that in a lecture. How far you can go if you know the acceleration. See this, you're going at a constant velocity. 50 miles an hour, I'm not changing. Well, what if you slam on the accelerator and do that for a half an hour? What speed are you going to get up to? Or how far will you go then? This relationship tells, figures that out. And uh, Galileo, using his inclined planes, realized the key that he'd do that data. Remember we did it with the fan cart that was accelerating? And the spacing increased. For the first second, it maybe went this far. For the next second, it went maybe that far. In the third second, it covered this distance. In the fourth second, so when you accelerate, your distance increases each increment. The square of each second makes it more of a linear relationship. And that's what Galileo figured out using all those. And the example I liked with that was, um, with free fall, you can play fun things. Because if I want to know how far something falls in a certain amount of time, I can use the acceleration due to gravity, g, and estimate how far it fell. So you, know, you, you drop your rock down the well, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, whoop! It takes three seconds. How deep's the well? I got a couple of votes for 30 meters. It fell for three seconds. It took the rock three seconds to fall down. How, how deep's that well? well? We're getting different answers now. One half. What's G? What's T? Squared. So half a 10 is 5, and 3 squared is 9. So it's 45 meters deep. Sweet. That was easy. I think that's fun. I do that a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm a nerd physicist, bored sometimes standing on a high ledge, but you know. 
No, this does not account for air resistance. Good point. So if I'm tossing a feather off, will it take more or less than three seconds? Much more. That's true. Because now there's another force going on. The motion, the net acceleration of a feather would not be G. It'd be G minus whatever the acceleration of air resistance was, which I didn't give you, and you don't know. But it'd be less, as we've observed in class. Yes? Could you discuss the way we should understand <coughs> net forces in the case of someone in an elevator standing on a scale? That's a good one. That's a great question. So somebody's in an elevator. We'll, we'll say he's standing on a scale. Standing on a scale. <laughs> and the elevator moves up and down. Let's, let's make sure you're with me. And the elevator's not moving. What's his weight? Uh, say he's, well, whatever. We don't need a number. It's uh, his mass times the acceleration due to gravity is his weight. Now, think about it. You're in the elevator, and the elevator, a zippy one. You know, you're in a Holiday Inn. Those are usually fast. You go up. It starts accelerating up the elevator. What do you feel initially? Do you, do you f yeah, you feel, whoa, heavy force. Why? And What were you going to say? Yeah, that's inertia. You're at rest. You don't want to change your motion. You have mass. You're resisting it. Something's trying to accelerate you, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. And so you, you try to stay put while it tries to ram up on you. So yeah, oh, yeah, that's why you feel that. But what that does is that, you know, that makes you push a little harder on the scale, doesn't it? The scale is accelerating and up on you. It's pushing. And so... Yeah, right at the beginning. If you're not moving and you stand on the scale, what's the scale read? Your weight. As soon as the elevator accelerates up, what does the scale do for a moment? Does it get bigger or smaller? Bigger, because you're, whoa, it's, like it's exerting a force up on you. And so it's adding to the value of, the, of your weight on the scale. So yeah, for that brief moment, you'll be a little heavier, or the scale says you're heavier. It's, it's adding to the net forces. You, know, you now have uh, two forces pushing on you. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Most elevators accelerate right at the beginning, and so you'll see a blurp. It'll get bigger as you just start going up. But it'll come back as you're riding up floor to floor to floor because it's got you up to a speed and now it just needs a, to maintain that. You're no longer accelerating up, you're just going up at a constant velocity until you get to the top and you stop. And right before you stop, what's the scale do? What do you feel? Yeah, it's like, whoa, because now you're moving up, right? And so your inertia wants to keep you moving up, but the elevator just stops, so you're like, you keep up going up a little bit and there's less force between you and the uh, scale, and the scale will read a little less than your normal weight. If you average them, it would equal what? Oh. If the elevator accelerated and decelerated at the same rate, yes, that difference you'd read on the scale would be the same. You can actually figure out how fast the, the elevator's accelerating this way. And yeah, I've done it. <laughs> Took my bathroom scale in the Holiday Inn elevator, sure enough, and you can note how far it goes up. Difference in weight normally, and yeah, you can actually calculate then the acceleration of the elevator. I know. You, ha you have enough math to do it. It's the net force. If this is what the scale reads when you're just standing there, and you know it goes up right when you start, then somehow it must be adding 
another term, your mass being accelerated up by the elevator. And that'll add to what the scale is reading. Now this is what the scale is reading. And you know at the top now that, oh, it's, acceler it's accelerating down to stop, but you're still moving up. And so you know it's going to be a little less of a reading. So common sense tells you I need to subtract that deceleration of the elevator at the top. So if you're good at algebra, you can do this right now. Just don't tell the, uh, if you all go running into a hotel that I sent you. <laughs> Yes, to finish this. The initial start up during the period that you're going from the ground floor to the fifth floor, will the scale read your weight? The weight that you would get on the scale if there were no movement at all. So you, you, you start going up, say, say and now you're just riding along? Say you're 500 newtons on the scales before the elevator starts to go up. 500 newtons before the elevator moves. And be an increase. A increase, yep. And then will it fall back down? Yes, it will fall back down to 500 while you move at a constant velocity up. Until you stop again, then you have to decelerate. The elevator is not accelerating up constantly. Otherwise, you'd be going faster and faster and faster and faster and blow out the top of the building. <laughs> it just gets you up to a speed. And to, re, uh, to reiterate that, that's like... The guys, the bear's still moving down because the net force is zero. Once this elevator accelerates up and gets up to speed, it doesn't accelerate anymore. And the upward force trying to keep it going up is balanced by the weight. And if they're balanced, it doesn't accelerate. It just maintains that speed. And, you, and yeah, you, it'll read 500 newtons again until you stop. Then boop, and then you'll be 500 again. Okay, there was one over here. Can an object be accelerating when its speed is zero? And we've given an, uh, yeah, an example just this class period. Can you think of it? And at what point is its speed zero when you throw a ball up? At the very top. Yeah, its speed is zero. Is it accelerating? At what rate? 10 meters per second squared, yes. So there's an example of an object where its velocity is zero at one point, but it's still being accelerated. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a non-zero net force on it, trying to accelerate it down the whole time. Yes? How do you find the change in velocity? How do you find the change in velocity? Depends on the case, but... If you're going a certain distance in a certain time, you have to know what, where you started or ended. But you must, most cases we've been doing, you know, I'm, not, I'm at rest, so the chalk's at rest. And it, it moves for a certain amount of time and gets up to a speed. We keep saying, yeah, we got it up to speed. Well, you can figure out either through this one or that one. If you know the distance, you can use that one. If you know acceleration, you know this one. If you rearrange this, The change in velocity is you accelerate for a certain amount of time. So if you know you're going 10 meters per second squared, gravity, for two seconds, if I drop something, I know two seconds later it's going to be going 10 times 2, 20 meters per second at two seconds. It's increasing. And at 10 seconds later, oh, the well, we did it for three seconds, right? 1, 2, 3 times 10, 30. I know when it hit the bottom, it was going 30 meters per second, ignoring air resistance. Um, this is important, too. This is what acceleration is. That's how you get it. That's how the relationship, Newton's second law, by pushing on it. You can accelerate it, but it depends on its mass and its inertia. That relationship will tell you how something is going to accelerate. This is more like a definition of what acceleration is, but this is how you get it. That's how we led. 
And third law, we have to make sure you get that, right? So if uh, you're driving down the highway and that, uh, oh, my favorite, I grew up in Kansas. It was great once at night. And uh, fireflies, because they, they glow, they're a little hiney, you know. And while it was glowing, splat, right on my windshield. It made a nice green glowing streak, and it glowed all the way home. Who felt more force? The bug or my car? The bug didn't feel anything. It was dead. Yeah. Last thing it saw was its hind. No, no, okay. Uh, no, seriously though, who felt more force? I haven't heard enough answers yet. This one's the counterintuitive one when I word it that way. They're the same. The bug exerted a force on the windshield. The windshield exerted a force on the bug. Equal and opposite in direction. That's Newton's third law. It's the same in magnitude. The force the bug put on the windshield was the same that it felt from the windshield. Yes, that was enough force to obliterate the bug, but it didn't need to be that much, you know, because the car's massive. That's Newton's second law. But the force between the two is the same. The bug has little mass, so he was accelerated the wrong way too quickly. <laughs> Matter. So they felt the same force. Yes, I won, but that's back to second law and first law. Okay, let me just make sure I didn't miss any key points I wanted to emphasize. That, that relationship between these. This is an equation I definitely think more of as a relationship than I do others. You know, for the same force, you increase the mass, what happens to the acceleration? If you uh, keep the same mass but you push on it harder, what happens? What, if it's going faster, can you, can you figure out how they change if you adjust something? Because I might ask you one of those. That was the only other thing that looked like I hadn't emphasized. Any last minute ones? You guys ready? Feel good? Oh, there is one. Oh, I love it. If the bug bounced off the windshield, would the forces change? Short answer, no. It's still Newton's third law. The force the bug exerted on the windshield would still be the same as the windshield on the bug. However, that force would be larger between the two than if it just went splat. And that's chapter six after the test. Isn't that great? <laughs> okay, see ya.